All right, let's get into the uh, symbolic frame. And uh, we'll try to look at um, th this in relation, of course, to leadership and followership. And then explore some of the cross-cultural implications of it as well. So back to our chart, you'll see we are now in the very chaotic world. As we move down the list into the political and into the symbols, it does get more in the chaotic side over here. So, <coughs> so you have ideas, you have activities, and, but there's ambiguity in that. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that's, that's a lot, but and which thousand words does one picture have? It depends on who's looking at the picture, right? So that's the ambiguity in there. But it, it drives you to your beliefs, your faiths, your emotions. And that's one of the strengths side of it, although some would look at it as the weakness side of it, is the emotional side of it. And so it's, it's recognizing that we are emotional beings and that we have to cover that side of it as well. So we'll get into that, um, the symbolic side now, and take a look at uh, what Bowman and Deal say on that. Um, first quote, and actually out, not from Bowman and Deal, but, um, great leadership works through emo the emotions. <clears throat> and you think about that. Not the facts, but the emotions. They may use facts to try to get to the emotions, but the focus is on the emotional side of it. So if you just listened to Obama the other day, it was all, if this is not passed, all these people are going to lose their jobs in the health world, in the military world, in the, and it's, it's very emotional, you know. And great leaders are very good at using your emotions to bring you to certain conclusions. Very, very good at it. What Hitler did? Like Hitler did. Fact. Yeah. Charismatic, yeah. Very charismatic in his speeches. Yeah. One of the best. Yeah. And the best manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. He was good at it. Very, very good at it. Not only that, but um, a lot of people have observed that the best leaders rarely are the people who know the most. Uh. Uh, they're rarely the people who are necessarily the most intelligent, but they're usually the best at doing this. And then doing this, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a side we don't tend to think about too much. We just, we're focusing on, you know, their ability to lead, their ability to make decisions, that type of thing. And yet, this emotional side is, we cannot forget this side of it. This so is. Is that quote saying that they, uh, the great leadership uses Properly uses the emotions. Is that what he means? Or he doesn't say he properly. He says he u they use it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they know how to work your emotions. That's how you get a crowd going, right? You can work up their emotions, and it's very easy then to sway them and cert to do certain things. <clears throat> so that's the focus. Not whether it's good or bad or indifferent, but it's a it's a strategic move to use emotions to sway people to make, come to various conclusions. An organization's character then is revealed and communicated most clearly through its symbols. So there's our ambiguity. So at Biola, our symbol is that eagle up there, right? That's our symbol. So I, I'm, I'm starting a movement. I'm gonna be very emotional about this and see if we can kill the bird and make the St. Bernard the new symbol for Biola. Strength, beauty, <laughs> intelligence. You know, what is that eagle like that? Look at that eagle. I mean, look at him. He's just scary looking, you know? What kind of intelligence does he have? Just nothing, just a little bird, you know, with a little brain. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna have a new symbol here. <laughs> well, but I need some help to help, you know, to help make this movement. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm just wondering how long has that uh, eagle been simply here? You know? I don't really know. 
I don't know. Uh, why they chose the turkey as opposed to, or they chose the eagle as opposed to the turkey. Turkey. <laughs> the U.S. I mean, the, I guess, according to Benjamin them. Franklin, it was, the turkey is an intelligent the, Yeah, bird. yeah, it is. That's why it drowns itself in the rain. <laughs> Something like that. So maybe it's good we didn't choose that. <laughs> uh, we need some investigation here on the evolution of the eagle here at Biola <coughs> to figure out what it, how long it's been here. When you <laughs> when you look at these symbols over here, do they tell any stories at all? Do they take you to any rituals at all? You know, take your mind to any of the rituals uh, about the uh, Star of David? You know, or or the fish? There we go. <coughs> I was thinking about the swastika when I was looking at that because um, it's originally Hindu. Ah. Uh -huh. But. <coughs> There's, and there's a key point right there. Just because it's the same symbol doesn't mean it carries the same meaning, right? That's a, that's an, that's a major point. It's almost worth an A. It's very close. Just, just, that was just bordering right there. Very, very, very close. <coughs> yeah, and there's our, there it is right there, okay? Um, Interestingly, uh, let's talk about that symbol a little bit before we go into their assumptions behind that. But um, in um, Lithuania and stuff, you see some of the times you see this on bread, <coughs> stamped into the bread. <coughs> and so you, it must have then a different meaning <coughs> than you have <laughs> that down in Germany where my relatives um, are <coughs> the swastika there. Do you know what the colors are represent or any of that? Any? Let me read it to you here. Um, let's see, this is from Hitler. Um, the lack of such symbols, flags, had not only disadvantages for the movement, but it was unbearable for the future. It was unbearable to the lack, to lack an emblem that had the character of a symbol of a movement. The red represented the social idea of the movement. The white represented the national idea. The swastika represented the mission of the, f the fight for the victory of the Aryan man and the victory of the creative work, which in itself is and will always be anti-Semitic. Hitler in Mein Kampf. <coughs> so now you know the rest of the story. Because see the colors, you know, it's, that's what, you, it, when you're talking about symbols, you're having to look at many, many things in there. And colors are, would be one of those. And then the design itself, and the swastika, and so forth. So all that carries tremendous meaning. And for Hitler, he had to have something like that to help the movement move. And usually what, yeah, we have our flags, right? And so. You think of World War II, what is that one picture you think of of the American flag being raised over Iwo Jima, right? And so the, 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 um, the flag at 9-11, when that happened there, and hanging all the flags there, and then everybody having flags in their cars and vehicles and so forth. <coughs> Symbols, full of meaning, and yet, differ so greatly when you take it from one context to the next. All right, let's look at some of the um, assumptions that Bowman and Dio place on the symbol side. Uh, appearance is more important than reality. So right, that's the ambiguity again, a little bit there. Um, interpretation is more important than what happened. Symbols are multidisciplinary organizational theory, sociology, political <coughs> science, and anthropology. So they're multidisciplinary. So you have to look at them 
when you start looking at it from those di different disciplines, you, help, you start to see different things come through in those symbols. And symbols are ambiguous and fluid <coughs> rather than linear. Forms to increase or decrease predictability and direction. And another thing they do, and this is another key thing, is they anchor hope. They anchor hope. <coughs> so every time you see the eagle at Biola, you feel hope. No, see, that needs to be a St. Bernard. Now you would feel hope. Okay, just making the case here for this, all right. Well, uh, we, we do have a symbol right here. It's the most enduring symbol since 1991. Which one? Well, the big Jesus. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're looking out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought he was going to Tacoma. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a <laughs> Tacoma. Yeah. You know, yeah. The question is, yeah, yeah. Does, it, does it anchor hope or does it uh, symbolize other things? You know, yeah. Many other things. Has that ever done that here on campus? The, the Jesus, the picture of Jesus over here on the wall, has that ever raised any questions on campus? Yeah, about every four years when you get a new group of students in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is actually a Russian Jew. Did you know that? That's a Russian Jew. Yeah. Okay, super. So, how do they function? How do symbols function? Well, they address the fluid aspect of the organization. Why? Organizations are never static, right? But by having a symbol, you can keep some stability there. <coughs> and so it helps address that, to keep things st steady when everything else is kind of moving along and, and being challenged in questions. It builds community. So I don't see any around the table here. Oh, there, uh, no. But you can go over to the bookstore and buy all kinds of shirts and s coats and whatever, sweatshirts that have Biola University on it of some kind, right? Go to a basketball game and d there'll be a deep red on one side at least. <laughs> so it definitely builds community. So. The short-termers will go out for us somewhere, all wearing the same color T-shirt <coughs> so they don't get lost at the airport. But, but it does, we are this, you know, this is us, who this is who we are. Third one, then bonds present, uh, uh, bonds present with history and geography. So it tells us who we are, where we are from. Um, so we would know that we're from La Mirada, California here and the history, we're going clear back to the fundamentals of the faith <coughs> when Biola Institute of LA began. It's ecumenical, or, or excuse me, not ecumenical, but economical in that what? You can, a little picture can say a lot of things. So that's the picture is worth a thousand words. So um, it's a very concise way of telling people who we are. <coughs> And the fifth one, then elaboration of the complex, ambiguous organization. So it turns ambiguity into meaning. So it gives, it gives direction as to definition um, as you look at those. So if you look at the Abrahamic religions there, the three symbols for that. <coughs> and there on the side there, um, each symbol rep representing one of the three religions that came out of Abraham. Lots wrapped up in that little symbol of David there, or the cross, or Islam there. So, a lot of stories, a lot of rituals that gives meaning and direction, hope, security, all kinds of things for those adherents to those th three particular faiths that are there. Um, I like those two, the fish in the bottom and the other side. You ever see these in the, when you're driving around? <laughs> it promotes culture, the culture of the organization. And that can include not just stories and rituals, but also gets into the artwork, which would be the Jesus over here on the wall. Um, other things, the bells, 
towers here on campus. They came from downtown LA. When, and I think if, um, I'm not sure, do you know this, Ivan, when the uh, a replica of the Jesus sign is coming to our campus here? When is that, do you know? Is that gonna happen this year? Oh, okay. Um, it wasn't my idea to have the Jesus Save Science. <laughs> it's it's going to be here. It was, it was already decided by, about, uh, it was decided by Dr. Corey. And yeah. He, he already made it public, but I think this year. Okay. And we're just trying to decide where to put it. Is it a replica or is it the real thing? It's a replica. A replica, okay. It's actually smaller. Okay. Wow, it'll be interesting where they're going to place that. Yeah, it wasn't my idea yeah. to have it here. Yeah. It just says Jesus. It just, it just, yeah, it's just written out Jesus, right? And it's, how big? It's pretty big though, isn't it? I mean, it was set on top big. of that building. It's still real big, but it's, it's about, it's like 30% smaller or something. So okay, it's, so it's, they it's short, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Ah, okay. And will it be lit up, lighting, you know, will they light it up and everything? So, it, oh. Oh my gosh, okay. All right. It'd be interesting. Yeah, that'll add flavor to the university. Um, <clears throat> it uh, copes with contradiction. And that, that's nice because that's the security part that it can bring and address the contradiction. It's always within any organization. Tensions are always there. It appreciates humor. It appreciates the metaphor. It appreciates celebration. And that's the rituals that come, that we have uh, for graduation, for other things that go throughout the school year. Uh, the lighting of the lights during Christmas time and you know, all kinds of little traditional things go down here, celebrations and so forth. And it, um, from that, the article we looked at, story, symbol, and ritual, bringing those three together, um, those really define the worldview of a school, of a church, of an educational institution, of a mission agency, all that kind of stuff is defined by the, that, that triangle of story, symbol, and ritual. And that's what uh, Bowman and Dio f uh, focus on for their last frame of reference here for our study. Another element to this is uh, the vision statement which in the 90s there are lots of books written on having a vision for your organization and having that vision drive it. And so everybody was trying to come up with nice pithy little ones that everybody could remember and this drives our organization. And that's, I mean, really when you think about it, for the 21st century, I mean, this hasn't lost its, if anything, it's become stronger because when you have different ethnicities are working together in, in some kind of team or partnership, um, this is what can really drive them. How it gets done, who cares? But this is what, they, they know what they're there, there to accomplish. And so the vision statement becomes something very, very powerful. So Nanu talks about there is no more powerful engine driving an organization towards excellence and long range success than an attractive, worthwhile, and achievable, so he starts laying out some of the guidelines for that vision of the future and then widely shared, widely shared by those within the, that organization, whoever they happen to be. So very, very powerful engine. We have to have it and that's what drives it. So every time there's a graduation, you will hear the vision statement of Biola University said publicly. Every time. It'll always be there. Every time we start a new semester, you'll hear that same thing by the, by the president um, or the uh, provost. One of the two are going to mention this every time because what are they trying to do? This is why we exist. You're part of that. This is the outcome really that we have for you as a participant within our educational system here. Um, why do we emphasize that, a vision statement? Because why? It sets direction tells us where we're going, what we want to do. And when Dr. Corey came here, one of the things that uh, kind of a change that was instituted was we want every student to become cross-cultural. That was his goal, 
to have some kind of cross-cultural experience before they leave, before they graduate. <clears throat> so that becomes part of the vision that he has for the school. And it always starts from where you want to go, not where you presently are. So it's always looking out there. So looking way out there. This is where we want to end up. And then you work back on how you're going to do it. <clears throat> Oh good, you made it. We wondered, we were hoping everything was okay. <laughs> Your wife okay? Yeah. Good, all right, super. Um, and what it does too, when after you're doing this for a while, sometimes the vision gets kind of blurry. So what it allows you to do to go back and look at it and it allows you to refocus, say, oh wow, we have kind of drifted off course here. We not have to start to bring this back in the course. So that's kind of that the, the anchor that's out there that can keep your, your direction of your organization going in the right way. And this of course offers opportunity for creating uh, teamwork um, to be able to work together because you know everybody knows what, what has to be done and they have you know how it depends on how the organization is broken down and set up but um, then um, that, offer, that affords you an opportunity to be able to focus and get your site, your group, getting your part done to reach the overall vision. <coughs> um, for those who are involved in creating the vision, this is, this is really neat because then you get, on, get really great ownership in that because you helped create that, that vision. But you know that's kind of like only for the first generation unless they redo it like Interact redid it a number of times, right? So that can happen too as the organization changes, as times change, then they decide, well, we need to change our <coughs> vision statement as well because we're not matching up anymore. So geography was one of the issues that Interact faced and had to then switch because um, they were going much broader geographically than their vision statement would encompass. Um, builds t common terminology too. So you start using, so there's insider language is what happens on this. You get code words and you know when you hear it that, oh, that's, they're one of us. And the outsiders are wondering, what, is it th what are they talking about? <laughs> because they don't know that, right? So, but there's code words that are always there that help you to feel like you're part of this group doing this uh, to try to accomplish that. So. <clears throat> Uh, and it, this is a good one too because anytime you're in any organization there are multiple things that can be done. And the problem is you can only do so much. And that was one of the questions for Interact. Are they doing, are they such a, they're a very small organization, are they trying to do too much? That was one of the big questions that was raised there. Um, so what it can do is say, okay, no, we that's really not part of our vision statement. So we need to move away from that. And um, so that's what they did actually on the Victory Bible Camp. They decided they'll cut that because that wasn't part of that. <coughs> um, it allevi alleviates false guilt so that there are some things you can't do. That's okay. Other organizations can pick that up. It's not your niche. Um, let other people do it and don't feel guilty because of that. You're here to accomplish this. That's why God brought you into being. Uh, specifies direction then for the resources. Tells you where you're gonna place your personnel, tells you how you're gonna spend your money. In those two areas. So it, once that's down, now you know we need people in this area. We need finances to cover this. and. Then so it provides direction in the use of material and immaterial uh, sources. <clears throat> and once again, too, it makes the passing of the baton a lot easier. You know when you've accomplished the end and you know when you've reached the end, um, if that's part of your, your goal is to come to an end. So Interact had it down, 50 years, we're done. That was part of it. So the way either have to change that or fold shop. Okay. Um, some of the, the properties then of a good vision statement, um, it has to look out in the future, so you can ask the question, how future oriented is it? But is it utopian? Does it 
we're going to reach the world for Christ. Okay, that's, you know, a little utopian. <laughs> so is it realistic? Is it appropriate? Um, those are some of the questions you would ask of your vision statement. Uh, does it set standards of excellence and reflect high ideals? So in other words, it is going to push you, but let's not push so far that it's really impossible to make it happen. But it can happen. It's possible. And it clarifies then the purpose and the direction. Does it do that? Can anybody coming in as a new or just let's say they're just looking at your organization and saying, do I want to work here? Can they pick up that vision statement look at it? Is it clear, clear enough and purposeful enough that they would feel, wow, I know where this is going and I would like to be a part of it. Is it that clear? Is the purpose that clear? Is it the direction that clear so far? So um, that's why it has to be written very sharply and succinctly and powerfully. Um, does it inspire enthusiasm? They read it and they think, wow, that's pretty cool. I would love to be a part of this group. I, would, I love what they're doing. I could do this. So it should inspire enthusiasm. And it should tell you, you know, how this group is distinct from other groups. So it's going to be very focused. Here's our niche. Here's why we exist. And we're not ashamed of it. This is what God caused us to, called us to do. And is it ambitious enough? So once again, not too ambitious, not utopian, but ambitious enough to make you want to become part of it. So those are just some of the key elements that would be in the symbolic frame and questions that we could ask, particularly about the vision statement itself. Uh, so without a vision statement, then well-intended ministry is mostly m motion without meaning. And that can happen in any organization. Everybody very, very busy, lots of motion going on, but not, you know, not getting any further along in being able to accomplish their goals. Because everybody's off doing their own little thing. The vision gets lost over time. Lots of motion but not directed in the right direction. So, okay, enough on the, the vision statement. And one of the most powerful, I think, parts of the vision, beside the vision statement, is the stories itself and how stories are used um, within any organization. Um, the hero founder stories um, think of uh, Walmart. What was the guy's name who started Walmart? Um, oh, gosh. Sam Walton. There we go. Sam Walton used to drive around from one store, to, in the beginning, from one store to the other store in his old beat-up pickup truck. <laughs> and that was symbolic. And what was he saying? I mean, did he have enough money? He could have bought a brand new, he could have had a jet. Or he could have had a, a chopper. He could have had all kinds of things if he wanted to. He, he, it wasn't that that was impossible for him to afford that. But what it was he saying to every, every time he showed up in his beat up pickup truck? We're here to get, the cheap, get things to the customer in the cheapest way possible. <coughs> He was making a statement about the vision he had for Walmart. <coughs> um, Ross Perot, remember him? Ran for president, when was that? A number of years ago. Became actually the third party, which cost one of the, was it Bush? I can't even remember who he ran, who ran with. Bush, I think. The other one. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. So they split the vote and Bush lost. Um, anyway, in his company, one of his company, or his major company, um, this story is told to all their new people who enter their organization. And they had some people who were um, caught over there in Iran during the Iran 
hostage situation that way, way back there. Two people were caught up in that and um, were put in jail, like many others. Some of the others were, of course, political prisoners and so forth. But what he did then is he got, um, um, what was the guy, I forget the name of the guy, but he's a colonel, a special ops guy. And um, so they sent people over, they had money tied into their suit jackets and so forth, and tried to get them out, didn't work. So they hung around, things were getting pretty hot there, and things were, then pretty soon the, um, a bunch of Iranians then um, charged the prisons and un released thousands of people. And when that happened, they were there to help the two that uh, were from his company. And then they took them across country, they went out through Turkey, and uh, the whole thing is written in this book here on the wings of eagles. <laughs> so they tell that story to all their new people who are joining their organization. And what he's, the message he's trying to get to them is that, look, if something happens to you, you know, we expect you to do your job, <coughs> and sometimes things go bad. If it does go bad, we will do whatever it takes to get you out. We will be there for you. Whoa. That's a company you would like to work with, you know? Because you know, they've done it in the past. Okay, if I get in trouble, all right, something happens over in India, We'll send people over there. We will get you out, Susanna. You, you will be okay. We'll do everything possible. That's a nice, comforting feeling if you're a new recruit coming and think, ah, I would join this organization. Um, yeah. Way, way back. Well, I wonder if that would happen now. <laughs> <laughs> telling everyone that no, whatever think, happens to you is up on your own. You're on your own. <laughs> Hero sagas. Um, New Tribes Mission likes to tell this story. It has happened in Colombia. And uh, one of their pilots went into one of the jungle places, jungle strips there. <coughs> landed and was captured by some of the guerrillas in the area. And uh, he was taken up into the village and held there. And one of the evenings he decided to try to escape. And so he went back, he got out of the village there and went down to where the airstrip was, untied the <laughs> Untied the airplane. <laughs> a little snoring going on over here. <laughs> Untied the airplane. It's pitch dark. There's no moon. And tried to figure out where the strip, you know, kind of where the strip ended and the trees began. And uh, started the, the engine of it, got it warmed up, and blasted down the airstrip. And looking out the window to try to make sure he was keeping it in the middle of the airstrip until he could get airspeed up and pulled it back and he got out. And that's one of the stories they like to tell how God protected <coughs> one of their own. And that's not always been true. New Tribes has lost a lot of pe personnel as well. But telling the other side of the story that there is also hope that you can get out in some of these situations. God will make it possible to happen. Even in when it's totally black, no moon, and the guy takes an airplane out of a jungle strip in the dark, you know? <laughs> yeah, hero stories. Cautionary tales. Oh, these are always good. Did you hear what happened to Jane? <laughs> She's no longer with us. <laughs> and then the story comes out, right? Yeah. Or how about uh, when they did Nova down in South America? The Chevy did. Nova means what in Spanish? <coughs> no go. <coughs> Not a good name to go with the car that you want to sell in Latin America. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Cautionary tales. So there's, and every organization has these. They have hero stories. 
they got hero founder stories. And I remember we got used to get so sick of hero founder stories. <laughs> so don't tell us another one, all right? That's enough already. <clears throat> Let's get something up to date here. <clears throat> yeah. Any of those come to mind to you? Any three, any one of the three? The uh, founder of Chick-fil-A, I've heard yeah. the story a lot, Kathy Truitt, I think was his name. Um, just how he started that and with his Christian convictions and so forth. Mm -hmm. Chick-fil-A, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Leighton Ford says, one way we pass on our values from generation to generation is tribal tales. Every family has them. Every organization tells them. They help to weave continuity between our core values and the changes which inevitably come. Jesus' symbolic actions were the stuff of tribal tales, which raises an interesting question. Who in your organization is the storyteller that does this type of thing, that helps keep the values going from one generation to the next generation? They're in there, but we tend not to pay that much attention to them. What Bowman and Deal are saying, what? Pay attention to them. These are very important people in your organization. Know who they are and give them the possibilities of telling those tales in the various settings so that your values do continue generational. <clears throat> so what are you thinking, Ivan? Mm. I, I, I really am wondering who are the storytellers of organizations. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, I think in our age, there's, less, there's very little, or um, it's difficult to get people to be loyal yeah. uh, to organizations anymore. Um, vision statements don't seem to hold together people as well as they used to. Mm -hmm. Even if people are more intent on having them, I think the leaders are more intent on having them kind of find a, a pithy statement that might you know, bind people together. Yeah. And it, it does to some degree, but I think that it's, most people are, are wanting just to just to get fed, um, and so. <coughs> but even within that, I'm sure there are storytellers. I'm just wondering what the role might be. How how. how yeah. Um, and they they don't necess necessarily be able, they don't necessarily have to be able to tell a good story. I think they just need to they need to be able to weave. Uh, themselves, you know, their subjects, their art, their organization, their vision. They need to weave it together in such yeah. a way that provides continuity. But they don't necessarily have to. You know, they, 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 they use symbols in, in that way. Yeah. I'm just wondering who they are now in the, in the organization. Yeah. For example, Dr. Corey, well, we all say doc, Dr. Corey for everything. We see him for everything. We, yeah. He tells the stories or whatever, this or that. But who else? But in other words, they have to be very loyal. They have to know what they're saying. And they have to be quite loyal or mm -hmm. have some strong attachment yeah. to the organization. So I think when I think of Dr. Corey, I think once again, let's go back to symbols. How about the Jesus thing? <coughs> See, he's tying a symbol back with, and a push on evangelism at the moment um, and tying it back to that symbol clearing, coming back from way over when Viola started downtown. So he'll tell the story about that. I remember you telling the story about the cops seeing that and, and they knew, you know, it's very foggy. They know when they see the Jesus thing, they're very close to where they need to go in the choppers as they fly over LA. And, they, and they, so he used that story. Um, but it ties it back to the history of why Biola was started, the purpose of it, evangelism thrust of it, and so forth. So, in that sense, I hear him reiterating some of the older aspects of Biola University. I've not heard him say anything about the fundamentals, 
of the faith. I haven't heard anything like that. Marginalized voices in the stories. Okay. Uh, in order to, you know, um, uh, I, I guess in order to provide a different history. Okay. Or a, an alternative, you know. The alternative, story, yeah. In order to uh, to raise something, you know, that hasn't been voiced. Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Biola's racist past. Yeah. With uh, Talbot theologians, and, you know, mm -hmm. Talbot himself. Uh, and that's been well documented. Yeah. But is it a story that has been, is, is a story that has been open and, and retold, as well as, you know, yeah. uh, the more, you know, I, I mean, it, is that, uh, it hasn't. I mean, it's been sort of locked away in the annals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, but but you know, it, it's, it's it's those are the things that uh, those are stories. I mean, um, when I read Adeyemo's. Uh, take a response to Talbot's theology. Uh -huh. uh, it's, that's a story. Yeah. Talbot, he, he tells a story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And every organization tends to have that in their, some of those in their closet, those stories. Right. right. And do they bring them out? Can they bring them out? Well, I guess. Histories or the marginalized histories, do they can they also provide a, a, a weaving of continuity yeah. in the organization? Because in for those who are, uh, if you're looking for political frame and symbolic frame, those who are in power usually don't like alternative histories. No. Otherwise, they wouldn't they would lose the risk they would risk their power. Yeah. They would risk their, yeah. their authority. Um, and yet, those who are margin are marginalized, you know, need their stories or their cultural tells to be spoken, mm -hmm. to be brought to the light, to be exposed. Yeah. Uh, and then they said, that, well, then we start to weave the continuity from that. That, that era to this era. Not, not from the position of power, but yeah. from the position of powerlessness. Listness. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, I think that's, that's the difference, I think. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so which stories do get told? Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. I like that connectedness from the past to the present, which is exposed, that's vulnerability. Vulnerability is strength, so. Uh, good, good deal. All right. Uh, oh, Max Dupree, we didn't read him there. Every family, every college, every corporation, every institution needs tribal storytellers. The penalty for failing to listen is to lose one's history, one's historical context, one's binding values. Uh, without the continuity brought by custom, any group of people will begin to forget who they are. How do you do that in today when there's such a, especially in the West, um, uh, a lack of concern for any history. You know, things are going too fast. We're, you know, why would you spend time thinking about Biola when it started way back there in LA? You know, we're here now. Forget all that history. History began when we were born, you know. <laughs> so, so why would you go backwards? We don't have time for that. The world's moving too fast today. And yet it was the it was a Latino who said well, that if you forget history, you're likely to repeat history. <clears throat> yeah. That's a hard one. I'm thinking back, and I had a list, and I, I think it's in your notes probably on there, but like in the, around 2000, there was about a, a, somewhere around 10 to 12 books that were written in the business world on the use of stories. And a lot of the CEOs were using them. And then other people were using the stories within the organization too for training, for every aspect of it. And, um, and socializing new people into the organization through the use of stories and symbols. 
Um, how do you bring in the past without turning people off? What, we can, what can we bring in so that it'll tie us to the past but move us into the future? Who are the storytellers that can do that? They're out there. They're definitely out there. Max Dupree again. Those people realize the value of tribal storytellers, the custodians of the history and the values and the culture of the group. Any healthy organization, like a good tribe, needs certain rituals and symbols like company picnics, outstanding awards, and memorial works of art. Okay. So we look at, I look at our school and I'm thinking, okay, how much ritual do we have in our school? Let's just do for faculty. How much ritual do we have there? Man, and I'm thinking, how many anthropologists do we have here? <laughs> and ritual's, you know, kind of a key part of anthropology, right? Symbol and ritual. Those are key parts to anthro. And yet we do very little ritual for faculty. And on the undergrad, they started giving awards out for I forget, there's about six different levels or something like that for at graduation each year for awards for ICS undergrads. To have a little ritual there and to have people, you know, can think through the semester and wonder who's going to get that award. Will I be one of those persons if I'm doing such and such during the semester? Um, so these are all, even the thing of picnics, right? Just a picnic party like that. <clears throat> celebrating birthdays. Um, what is in your institution that brings these type of things to bear so that there are memorable moments uh, in the annual work cycle of the, of the year? <clears throat> Those are really important ones. Okay. Instead, towards like their clients. Yeah. Here, here's an example of customer service at its best. Yeah. And they give a story of uh. Hong Kong or you know Austin, Texas. Or so and so did such and such. It's one of our stories to catch on to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. CEOs are kind of looked down upon. So you bring the stories down. Yeah. You make it about the, the partners or startups. Mm, or there you go. Their clients. So. Who, who are the partners at Starbucks? The people who work there. That work there. They're, so they're called they're partners. Called partners. And how do they reward those? Or how do, what kind of ceremonies do they give for any? You can give out like pins. Pins. Like Okay. They're little cards, you know, encouragement cards. Or they're not very much used at my store, but because um, <laughs> 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 nobody's improving, or, <laughs> <laughs> um, or I won't go to that yeah. Starbucks then. <laughs> um, they have those sort of things, you know, promotions. Or, uh, there's not many other like, those sort of things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Stories are trying to be shifted now from CEO to the people on the. Uh, okay. Okay. To reflect that, that so, so, so Wikipedia is pushing it down to the partners. Yeah. All right, there we go. <coughs> hmm. it, so go ahead, David. Yeah, it was easier to, you know, build the culture of storytelling in a flat organization. Yeah. 
because I'm just thinking about you know my communities back home. The stone is part of life. Yeah. And these stories go way back, and they started like the elders are revered because of that, because they're like the the, the bank of the history. They will tell you everything, uh -huh. and there are special occasions for that. Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've been in organizations whereby there's communal sense of you know belonging. The story is part of it. Uh -huh. But in a very linear hierarchical organization. Stories yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's what David's mentioning reminds me of how you know, when I was reading that book, I found this very difficult to relate to. Uh huh. The other three, especially the first two. Yeah. And oh, interesting. One of the things I noticed right away is uh, for example, I'm involved in church ministry and in preaching here in this country. The, the power of a story is usually viewed as the only reason for a story, the only reason for an illustration is to illustrate yeah, a illustration. proposition truth. Right? Yeah, right. there we go. Yeah. So the only purpose you got of the story it. is just to support the more important issue of the proposition truth. Yeah. Because one of my friends just deployed on missions to Malawi um, a couple years ago to South Africa. And the missionary who was hosting him there you know, said, okay, I want you to prepare six sermons. You know, you're going to be preaching a lot during the few weeks you're going to be here. Um, but you cannot prepare any sermons from the epistles. They all have to be added from the <laughs> or the Old Testament narrative. Uh, which was very hard for my friend because wow. we were trained, you know, epistles, 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 yeah. you know. Um, and we only tell stories to illustrate those propositional truths. Um, whereas, yeah, my, my friend came back and said, you know, whenever I would do the propositional truth thing, you know, three points, you know, uh, no one would understand what he was talking about. <laughs> but it was, only, it was only when he started talking about his own struggles, how his wife went through cancer, you know, how uh -huh. he proved himself good in his life these past few years and so forth, you know, all the eyes lit up and everything. And so, yeah, there's a cultural issue going on here. Yeah. Outside of the Western Hemisphere, yeah. stories have inherent value apart from being able to illustrate the <laughs> but it's a, Beyond illustration. Yeah. That's worth an A right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, that is so, yeah. Yeah. Something that I noticed too from my, uh, that's kind of how I, like, uh, when I'm teaching French and stuff like that, you know, uh, it has to be very contextual. You get a child, and they, don't, they don't have a, a concept, and then you say, okay, now that concept is the table. <coughs> <laughs> they see something that's contextual, it's a table. Or they see, you know, relationships, okay, mother, father, sister, um, those sort of things. Uh, everything is contextual. And even, um, you know, I think just in life, everything is contextual. So if we can make language contextual, then it's easier to learn. Just even like looking at, uh, there was a Ugandan pastor that uh, comes to speak, speaks at our church once in a while. And, you know, I can still remember some of the sermons he's preached in, you know, the past couple of years, but I can't remember a single sermon pastor has preached. Mm. What does that say? I mean, <laughs> the, the, the Ugandan, he's using, he's giving, he's using a, using a story mm -hmm. to make points. Whereas mm -hmm. over here they're making points and they're using stories to support it. Yeah, so what are you going to remember more? Yeah. Facts, straight facts, or, you know, I give you a story and then I ask you to uh, give me facts from that story. You're going to remember that probably a lot better than this. Yeah, and yet yeah. here, if a preacher tells too many stories, he's criticized for it, right? Yeah. But we said, oh, he's just a storyteller. That's not a good thing. No depth here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no depth. You're just telling stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's just a storyteller. Yeah. Oh, he's only weaving our organization more tightly together. Yeah. It's just <laughs> But he's just a storyteller. It's like Billy Graham. I mean, I, I remember people saying this. Okay, I've heard this being said. Oh, Billy Graham. I mean, he just tells stories I and mean, saving the world. But he's just telling stories, you know. <laughs> I realize here yeah, politicians tell stories during campaign times. Yeah. 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 That's what people remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, but actually, it's, it's because it's because we compartmentalize content and content. There we go. So much, whereas really, uh, in, in any in any nation, any culture outside yeah. the West that's high context, that is the content. Yeah. It really is. There's a, there's a seamless flow. Uh, the proposition uh, is 
you know, cannot be articulated uh, in one sentence abstractly. Mm. It is embodied in a whole narrative, mm. right? So that that's why the sermon is, you know, it's really a, a mm-hmm. narrative. Yeah. You know? uh. We're, we're changing that. I mean, Ken Edwards and um, over here at Talbot, Dr. Sanukian, uh, Vic Anderson at Dallas Theological <coughs> Seminary. Um, Grant Lovejoy used to be in the Southern Baptist side of it, but in ta- hom- homiletics, but pushing the story side of it really, really strong now for this postmodern uh, audience that we have here. And I remember Kent Edwards, I had him in my narrative class, and he was, he was funny, but he was talking about you know, he got his first, he's got his first church to serve at, and um, pretty soon he realized, I'm going to be out of sermons pretty soon, because <laughs> he was only teaching from the epistles, right? So, I mean, that's kind of like what they do, right? So, I'm going to be out of sermons here pretty soon, and I don't know what to do. You know, it's kind of like, okay, then we change churches. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. So, you, you know, you only have so many sermons, so you get through those, you go to another church, right? In two and a half years or whatever it takes, and then you go. Then he, that's when he started broadening out and said, I got to get, you know, look at some other type of genres here. And that's when he moved into, and so now he, I mean, he's a big advocate of, of using story as the point, making the point, right, rather than illustrating the point. So, or being the point, I should say, rather than illustrating the point. Yeah, that's, and that's changing. It's, it's coming slowly, but it's coming. Just, in, in, in cultures, in or, well, not just oral cultures, but many cultures also in the West, it's okay to repeat the same ah, old story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because we value originality and our humor and, and proposition so much here, we can only tell it once. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 get, I complain when I go to a comedy club and the guy's using old material. I'm like, come on, you know? But the thing is, <laughs> that's the best thing that they in a in an oral culture, you really <coughs> a culture that truly uh, uh, values narrative, they can repeat that story uh, with different endlessly. It's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. And eventually, it's the same proposition that yeah. that works itself out too, right? Yeah. But um, but I think because we see Jesus through the eyes of Paul rather than seeing through Paul the through eyes the of the Jesus. Yeah. And the gospel being being pretty much all narrative. The mm-hmm. gospel. But and Acts as well, uh, Luke Acts. It, it's just, I think we're seeing it the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is that we see it through the eyes of the proposition, Jesus through the eyes of the proposition, and how Paul interpreted Christ, mm-hmm. rather than seeing Jesus as, as a centerpiece, uh, explaining yeah. uh, or giving uh, support or explaining to all the other narratives in the Old Testament and New. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a huge issue. It makes yeah. it more transmittable too. I mean, it, it's kind of what yeah, mean. yeah. You can transmit the the narrative of the company or you know, the school or the nation or whatever much easier through a story. Even a kid can do that. Sure. Um, and so, if you have a narrative to to tell, then anyone in that uh, organization, whether it's flat or hierarchical or whatever, yeah. or young or old, anyone can tell it. And yeah. If we're telling a story, then it's much more transmittable and much more uh, <coughs> transcultural. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes us beyond facts into the emotional and the imagination side of it, which just gives it that much more energy and that much more. That's why it's more memorable, because it becomes wow. I, you know, you think about it, you expand it, you play with it, and. The emotions come in, well, you cry, you, you laugh, you, you know, all kinds of things can happen when you hear these stories. <clears throat> uh, for David, for you, a question. Um, <clears throat> I've heard this, in, and I forget which part of Africa it was, so maybe you can help me here, but before a person would speak, preach, or something like that, that they would need to give their testimony to just show that they are part of the body of Christ in that sense, and then be able to move into the sermon post, <coughs> post their faith story. Well, I think that depends, but I think uh, <coughs> normally if you're a guest, that would be, <coughs> people don't know you, and yeah. I think that would be very helpful. <coughs> the 
because you're trying to connect with the people. Yeah. But if they know you, then I think you would jump into uh -huh. you know, the ministry. Yeah. But if they do not know you, they, so to connect with them, this is who I am. And then yeah. Then, uh, so then we're back to the real. A lot of stories. Yeah. yeah. So back to the relationship, building that relationship with speaker to because audience. Asking, who are you? Yeah. Rather than what are you telling us? Yeah, there you go. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and we're thinking, what are we telling them? <laughs> Rather than who we are to you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, this, uh, this issue of the custodians of the history and values. Yeah. Um, the idea of that a known truth that is retold can actually be a value. That that's it's something that yeah, different cultures definitely view very differently. Yeah. Right? Like for example, in the more westernized churches, besides the criticism of oh he's just a storyteller, another criticism is I've heard that all before, right? Or, yeah, there, right, new, right. Nothing new. I'm not that because I'm not learning anything new. Yeah. But then you know, even within this country, you go to an African American church and. They're hearing the same truths over and over, but you can tell they're, they're celebrating these truths, right? You know, there's some call and response going on, yeah. uh, and people might not be as apt to criticize the preacher for not teaching them something new, um, but are actually celebrating the fact that it was all true again. Um, there, there you go. Wow. So. True again. Yeah. 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 But I think also the depth of the story uh -huh. is the thing that calls for the repetition. Because if yeah. it's just a story, as the story said, you can forget. Yeah. <clears throat> like here, people talk about our founding fathers. Yeah. These are the principles they laid down for us. Yeah. And it's still relevant. So I think the depth of the story matters. Mm -hmm. People are always proud of the depth of their story, yeah. rather than just, you know, this is what, but, you know, what does it mean to us today? Yeah. And if still has value, mm -hmm. I'm sure you will have to repeat it. Yeah. Because I was, in, I was part of this church where my, they came together. For them, the question was, how do we create a room for the neighbor? That was the whole idea. Uh -huh. And they gathered together and they said, who's our neighbor? And what do we do? And today, that's what guides them. At one point, uh, there was a count. And they were having a celebration. And they were short of parking. And, uh, you know. They approached the church and said, can you help us use your you know, uh, parking facility? Uh -huh. And uh, the people said, yes, that's who we are. Huh. And all the other churches said, you are now, you know, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. But that gave them an end. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. that so it's yeah. that part of the story. Yeah. So I think the depth of the story is very important. Yeah. And I'm sure the stories that have endured are deep stories. Mm. Deep, deep. Yeah. They never go away. That's the thing. Propositions. Yeah. 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 They yeah. never go away. Propositions can be repeated, but uh, cannot. Um, uh, they can't change all that much. The depth of the experience of the there you go. Or the yeah. always changes. So the value changes, mm -hmm. and it moves from, from shallow, from deep, to, from deep to deep, really. Yeah. And then that's why you can keep repeating it. That's why you can keep. There's multi layers to that that are discovered over repetition. <coughs> so the experience can still be fresh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Always fresh because you see a different layer. But that's where the imagination can come into play and to help get that. <coughs> Good, okay. We're now in the narrative class. There we go. <laughs> Come join us in the fall. There we go. Advertisement. Symbols, oh, look at this. Is teaching that in the fall? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a modular, so I'll come down and teach it. <clears throat> Symbolic and cultural issues were almost absent from the literature on organization and management until about the night about 1980, though they had a central place in anthropology for many years. Every system, every, watch this, seating arrangement, every visit can be seen as symbolic behavior. Each day can be looked 
add a new scenario. Each meeting, a new setting for dramatic action. No events and no players are then too trivial to ignore in the great symbolic drama of a successful corporation. <laughs> wow. Just the seating arrangement alone. Who sets where? Okay. And the type of seating arrangement, right? So we're in a s kind of a circle here. And or we could do the more traditional educational mode where you line them all out like the military, right? And look at the backs of heads. <laughs> <laughs> Which, there's a lot of symbol about that, right? A meaning about what that says. <clears throat> it says that what? All truth is going to come from the front of that, and the rest of you peons are to learn from the truth coming from up front, all right? <clears throat> <clears throat> The circular will say what? Truth could come from any direction around this table and is expected to come from any direction around this table. Yeah. Wisdom come from anywhere. <clears throat> Seating arrangements, wow. So each meeting, who sets where? And the apostles going to, G or the disciples going to Jesus and saying, using their mothers to try to get them a little better seating arrangement. <coughs> uh, can't ignore those. But it probably takes a pretty good mind to see that. It yeah. does. At times. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just, yeah. Mm hmm I mean, Robert Weber, people that are in the worship circle, yeah. the worship theologian, talk about the space in worship and like that. And usually a little bit more uh, indicative of a, of a privileged culture. Mm. To be able to arrange your chairs <laughs> in that way is really a sign of privilege. Yeah. So it's, it is, in a sense, not just symbolic, but political. Ah, say. we have a connection to another frame. I would say. Because it has to do with uh, class uh, uh, privilege and, and, and accessibility. Sure. Well, especially back in, uh, let's see it. George Miller's time, I think he tried to change the, uh, yeah, tried to change the seating in his church because people would pay money to sit up towards the front. <laughs> that was in the church. That was in the church. Then you pay money, and so the more wealthy you are, you would sit up in the front. Uh, uh, yeah. Tore the things off the sides. And one of the assignments that I, I did for the, for the um, Principles of Church Multiplication class was to have you go when you're in church and the sermon gets boring, then you draw the church, a picture of the church and identify all the symbols just where you're sitting and looking around on the walls and the, the placement of the seating arrangement and the placement of different furniture, the rest of it, and tell me what is trying to be communicated to those who are in the worship service. Just do it inside the church, inside the main sanctuary, and just looking at where is there a cross, and if there's so, where is the cross placed? Is there a podium, and where is the podium placed? And what is on the podium, if there's anything on the podium? And in many evangelical churches, what's right dead center? If there is a podium, it'll be right there saying what? The word is central uh -huh. to this group. Yeah, and Jesus is central to Biola University, <clears throat> exactly. And looking at the, are the, is the platform where the speakers are raised? How much is it raised? And showing 
clergy laity divisions. Where's the baptismal, if there is one? Organ stuff on the walls. What does the music, what does that say about the music and worship? Flags on the wall. What? There you go. How big it is, or clearer, or see-through. Yeah. Can people see each other's faces? Yeah, the circular versus the linear. Well, people are wondering why uh, Biola, uh, this, you know, this institution, people are always wondering why is it that it's so difficult for us to raise money from our alumni? Because, you know, uh, most college institutions raise try to raise a, yeah. a, a, a good amount of money from its alumni, not just outside donors, but people who have been here who have uh, received a legacy from the institution or teaching or something or discourse. <laughs> but and, and, and my, my, uh, when I first came to Biola, somebody told me, well, here in Southern California, uh, schools have a tougher time uh, creating lasting legacy uh, upon the students to symbolically tie them together to, huh. uh, to, uh, to, as a community in order to give resources in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I was always wondering why about that, but, but as I looked around the campus in my first year here, I realized there's very few symbols. Yeah, yeah. There's actually very few uh, artwork, symbols, mm -hmm. things to actually, we feel, and I think because uh, the university hasn't really valued it, Mm -hmm. And so they're wondering why there's no lasting legacy and, and you know, uh, lasting symbols. And uh, so not only that, but that also proves that this university tends to stay in the rational world yeah. rather than in the ambiguous, uncertain. There we go. And, and chaotic. Well, I, I don't like to call it chaotic, but, you know, but yeah. more ambiguous world. Yeah. And, uh, but it's the ambiguous world that actually uh, emphasizes uh, the, the truths uh, that, that we retain better, mm -hmm. right? So the, um, yeah, I think the, 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 more that, the more we delve into the ambiguous, the more that we experience the, the truth, you know, which is why we remember the sermons that are really yeah. all completely one big narrative. Mm -hmm. and we just re remember those things. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, yeah. that, I can see that being yeah. why yeah. we prefer that. And we, don't, we see the sim symbols as being uh, periphery. Yeah. At best. Yeah. Marginalized at worst. Right? And story the same way. Story it same way. doesn't raise to the level of propositions. <coughs> right. Right. Yeah. Although, can you have a proposition without a story would be an interesting question. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Got this picture in Thailand last time. <coughs> symbol, very familiar. Global symbol, only he's got a little different pose here. <laughs> he has the nice Thai pose, okay? And it's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. How high should that really go, you know? Because, <coughs> you know, the, the higher it goes right in Thailand, the, the more respect that's showing and the higher rank that the person has. That's not real high there, but. Um, yeah, from a clown, I'm not behind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let's go to Japan. Oh, in front of a, in front of a ATM machine, though. <laughs> yeah. it's it's more, I see the ATM machine more clearly yeah. than, than Ronald. Yeah, it says interact on that ATM machine. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Are you familiar with this one? Tomoko? No? <laughs> you need to be. You get on the wrong road during the... So the, the, the story behind... I mean, the, it's not just a fish, okay? But it's a big giant fish. And when that big giant fish starts wallowing around, then you have an earthquake, right? And so there are certain roads you can go down and certain roads that will be open and won't be open. Yeah. The Chinese? Oh, Chinese. I'm sorry. Right, right. They use Japanese use a Chinese a lot. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. It's language. Mm -hmm. right. This is not just on Japan. There we go. I know it is, but then like right away, I haven't seen I haven't seen a Japanese character. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another one. This is an interesting one. <coughs> 
A few years ago, uh, Garrett's is an anthropologist, right? A few years ago, I heard a story from Clifford Garrett's about a visitor to Japan who wandered into a department store in Tokyo. It was a long time ago. At a time when the Japanese had begun to take a great interest in the symbolism of the Christmas season. And what symbol of the Christmas season did the visitor discover prominently on the display in the Tokyo department store? Santa Claus nailed to a cross. And that's what happens when you take symbols cross-culturally, right? And you just, you don't know the meanings of them, so you just blend them together and looks good, you know? <laughs> Well, it skewed the meeting a little bit there. <laughs> for some. Huh? For some people. For so, yeah. For, for, only, some, for only some people. For only some people. For those looking on from that direction, hey, that must be all right. Not a problem. Yeah. For, for those who are ethnocentric, especially from the U.S., they would call that syncretism. <laughs> exactly. But for those who are not, it would actually have a, a, a dual meaning or more. So. Mm-hmm. Would you have some meaning that's not necessarily bad? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Mr. Bean maybe when he comes to the States, you know, he gets symbols mixed up. Waves to a biker and the biker flips him off and he's like, <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, okay, I'll do this to everyone. Uh -huh. Switching symbols, you know. Yeah. <laughs> are some other symbols here. The best leaders, especially in chaotic conditions, effective generals, leaders of revolution, almost without exception and at every level, are master users of the stories and symbols. And um, this one, when MacArthur shows back up in the Philippines where after he says, I will return, right? This is the return in Leyte there. And I always thought, this poor guy here, <laughs> in all of history, he d the one moment he turns to talk to somebody, they snap the picture, and nobody knows <laughs> who the guy is. You know, and with MacArthur too, you have to think of what was one of his symbols was the corn cob pipe. You know, that's what you think of when you think of uh, General Douglas MacArthur. And then uh, pre the uh, the. Um, the killing of um, Osama bin Laden there. Um, notice too that when he would send out messages, he didn't send them out in written format. Didn't send a type letter out, you know. Uh -uh. They were all done, what, in video format. And you know the CIA guys are going to be looking at that picture, when those pictures would come out, they're looking at everything in the picture. Color, dress, position of the gun, everything. Because those are codes that are signals to his people to start doing something. And so they're, they're studying that. That whole picture is just full of code. And so the military is going to be looking at that under very intense scrutiny to figure out what is the message being sent out. But he didn't send it out. He'd always send it out in verbal format or pictures or both, but not in written format. Wow. Didn't use that. Wow. Interesting, huh? The oral and the symbol were the way he communicated to his people. Yeah. This is a fun one, too. Um, the Jewish people, as they celebrate um, Purim. And it's kind of like a Mardi, Mardi Gras festive occasion um, that's there when the little girls dress up like Queen Esther. And, and then um, they, somebody reads the story. And then every time that um, Haman is mentioned, they shout him down. <laughs> you know, so it's, they just, it's just a festive time, but it's also, I mean, this is a story that goes back in Israel's history until a long, long time ago. But by doing that on an annual basis, it's showing what? That we have, we're still here. We have made it as a people. And so they repeat that story to celebrate their existence today. 
and they make it a very festive occasion. Then a lot of liquid is taken in and <clears throat> very festive occasion. Um, so, and this gets back, what ceremonies and the questions raised and what ceremonies and rituals do we do within our institutions to celebrate the past and to get us focused on the, on the future? Um, a number of years ago, I had a church growth class and we took it to the church I was attending over in Green Hills. And um, they had just had a very uh, statistical study done on their church. And so we wanted to come in and kind of do it. Let's just talk to the leadership. Let's talk to people. Let's gather stories and see what we can come and come up with the same, what do they, if it, it matches what they did statistically, match the stories to the stats. Okay, and actually it did, came very close to the same thing. But one of the great things that was done then, they had a celebration at the, um, one of the services then, and they brought people in, and the church didn't actually start in that facility, started a different part over here in Whittier, and then moved over there <coughs> to Brea. And um, so they brought in people who helped start and founded that first church over in Whittier and spoke about how hard it was and how difficult it was getting it started and all the tears and all the prayers and all that stuff. Told that story and then they moved it into how it moved into Brea and what happened there and who was responsible for that. Uh, told all those stories like that. And then so we had a, a very, in a one service you had a sweep going from here's the history of the um, the church, and then the pastor gave, here's where we want to go in the future. So the future was based on the past and where they come from. After the service, and um, this was in a, um, one of the buildings there in the, uh, so it was a public building, so it was a, where they did all their plays. And so the stage was up here on top, and you know, the semicircle with this, the seating arrangement. But on the stage, they put out um, that big barber, uh, butcher paper, rolled it out. And the church was only like seven or eight years old, I forget what it was, something like that. And they would put, mark the years on it and section it out. When you came in, you were given different post-it notes, different colors. And you would write on there, I was baptized on. I was a teacher, Sunday school teacher during such and such a time. I was married on. <coughs> or something, whatever, all kinds of things, whatever you, you did in that church. Um, you were given that, you wrote all those down. So after the service, they went up, people, everybody went up, and they put those different post-it notes on the years in which they were involved in whatever they did. Uh, my child was born and baptized on this, or was baptized on this day, or something like that, you know, anything like that. And. Um, Everybody then just stood around reading this whole thing. So they're now reading the history of different people who were involved that didn't get a chance to speak during the, just a brief service, you know, of less than 50 minutes probably. Um, but they got their little points down and their, their little stories posted on the various years in which they had a role in that church. Very interesting way of using to, because how many people know the church that you attend now, do you know how it began? Yeah, most of us don't know, if especially it's an older church. You might know a little brief thing about it, but um, probably the major players don't know like that. It, it gets lost over time. And what that did is it connected the past with the future. Super, I mean, it was powerful, one of the most powerful services I've ever been to, how they do. So ceremonies like that, uh, Purim, of course, goes back a lot longer <laughs> than seven or eight years, but the idea is the same. It's catching, you know, it's revisiting the past to bring it up to the present and enjoy the, the meaning of what God has done over the years. So rituals, what do they do? They anchor us uh, to a center while freeing us to move on and confront the everlasting unpredictability of life. 
providing a stable dynamic in our lives. Ceremonies, same thing now, so rituals to ceremonies, very closely related. Ceremonies serve four major roles. They socialize, stabilize, reassure, and convey messages to <coughs> external constituencies. So they're like the anchor, both to help those within the organization and those without the organization. Let's finish up the uh, symbolic frame of reference here. Anytime you have ritual, anytime you have ceremony, you will be able to see status and role taking place there. <clears throat> it will be there. And often it's in those very funny robes at graduation. Notice the three stripes. <laughs> Some of you are after those three stripes. <laughs> you will be, Ivan, just, it'll happen. Celebration can serve dual purposes, mourning and meaning making. Because there's an end, right? There's usually an end to something. Graduation, there's an end, but there's also a moving into the future. Dual role. Morning and meaning making. Rewards are what people receive for completing a task or reaching a goal. Rewards are tangible symbols of appreciation for a job well done. Recognition is how people know the effort they put into their work has been noticed. What's that? It's like you gave her a sugar high, she wants to still. She's still looking for food. <clears throat> Rewards. Every organization has to have some kind of rewards, whatever they happen to be. People have to be rewarded. So in the educational system, you have ranks for teachers, right? From assistant to associate to full professor. And three ranks within each one of those. And then you have to go according to scholarship, service to inside the organization or outside the organization, and teaching. Those are the three things that's looked at at Biola. And you have to, each time you go a level higher, it becomes more requirements, right? So if you are going to move from associate three into full professor one, one of the requirements will have to be, you have to have a book. You'll have to have a book. If you don't have a book, very difficult to make that next jump. That's the co-author? Yeah, you could co yeah, it depends on, yeah. Um, that's possible. Depending on, then you have to see who did what and the workload that would be associated with that, yeah. But that's possible. Mm -hmm. Co-author, maybe a co-edited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just using other people's work to and putting it together. It's okay, but at that point, if you're going to demonstrate you're a professor, then you need to have something that demonstrates in your area of expertise you have made some kind of contribution. Can't do that, then they're not going to give you that that level. Then there's three levels there. So <laughs> then after that, then I don't know what you do. So I guess, well, then it goes to a distinguished professor. You could do that. Um, that's a possibility. So it will define status and role. And if you're on the, in the faculty here then, and then you watch who marches up first during graduation. It'll always be those who are the highest levels in the school. So you have the board goes and then you know all the deans and all that. But then when the faculty comes, those are it'll be full professor three, full professor two, one, and then right down, associate and right on down. So they put them in lines like that. Nobody follows the lines, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> no comment, no comment. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, that's the way it's set up. <laughs> Whether people follow it or not, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but it is to emphasize status and role within the, within the um, institution here at Biola. <clears throat> Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.